Uh, okay. Wow. Dan Lalonde. Dan Lalonde. Dan Lalonde, yeah. Hey, I got a trivia question for okay. you. Okay. All right. So what do Ernest Borgnine, Terry Garr, and Eli Wallach all have in common? Uh, they're massive stars. That's true. They've also all appeared in Dan's movies. Really? That's right. Yeah, he wrote those movies. He's wow. a great writer. He's a teacher. And, I mean, he's just a super funny guy. Yeah. So we need to meet him. You ready? I'm ready. You guys are always ready. Yeah, let's do this. Let's Come on. Let's go. Hey, Dan. So, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to have you here. It is. Thank it you, is. It is. Super excited to get to know you. You know, I would only do this for Norm. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank so you, you know each it. other, obviously. Yeah. We've known each other from way back. Norm and I have done things on and off uh, way back. A sketch comedy show for community television. Okay. Yep. yep. Several decades ago now. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, on and off various things, including Norm, has actually been in some movies I've written. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, which ones would they be? Norm, uh, which ones were you in? Well, I was, uh, oh my gosh, I was in House of Luck, I believe. I was in, uh, what's the, oh, the last one you did. <coughs> were you or, in, uh, I gotta remember now. Were you in, with uh, Ernest Borgnine. Uh, oh, the, uh, Kiss of Death. Kiss of Death, Death. yes, Death. which I played the And I believe which, you were also in a TV series that I wrote called uh, Man to Man. Yes, yes, ah. yes, yes. So maybe we yeah. should uh, familiarize ourselves with what kind of writing you do before right. we go any further. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I kind of previewed it there, but, uh, but yeah, mostly, mostly screenwriting. I try my hand at other things, mm -hmm. uh, and over the years, you know, in, in, in part just to kind of make a living, to keep consistently employed, but also in part just because you want to try your hand at all kinds of different things. Right. I've written everything under the sun. I've written uh, uh, TV programs. I've written yep. animation. I've written for radio. I've written blogs. I've written criticism. I've written journalism. I've written, believe it or not, DVD disclaimers and crossword puzzles. Yeah, give me a break. DVD disclaimers. So DVD can, disclaimers. Can you give me an example of? I uh, you know something that like uh, you know um, uh, you know this program is you know one of the, oh, one of those yeah. okay. little things you know before What's the movie starts. Criticism. Yeah. You said you've written criticism. Yeah, I've worked on and off as a film critic, oh. uh, and I've been doing this. I started off in university doing it for uh, collegiate journals mm -hmm. and then uh, kind of dropped it for a while and then when the internet flourished and right. everybody was you know doing all kinds of neat online cultural uh, magazines and sites I thought oh here's a good chance to get back into it mm -hmm. and so I was a film critic mostly for classic film older vintage stuff okay um, for, for a good a good maybe decade doing that on and off wow. for various things online so uh, you would now would you go to see films or I guess if they were the classic ones you'd, you'd rent them or watch them yeah, just write well, them on, on your own. Not even really go and see the film. Just have a stock. <laughs> yeah, well, did you, yeah, I'm sure you. I'm I, I, the kind of guy you are. You'd watch the whole film. Oh yeah, I, for I, sure. I think so. Oh, for right? sure. I'm, I'm like a yeah. movie nut from okay. from like way yeah. way way back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a really nice carte blanche with a lot of those gigs where you just had to have a column every week. Uh, oh, okay. But but kind of what it was about was kind of up to you. So I would look at what was okura amongst contemporary movies. So mm -hmm. for example, let's say uh, The Hateful Eight comes out. And okay. I'd say, ah, westerns are back. So you'd like a little, you'd write a little intro saying, you know, uh, hey, westerns are back with the hateful eight. But if you want to delve the history of the genre, and then I would go back and I would kind of, you know, give small reviews of past favorite westerns, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, a weird question, but when when you're reviewing or yeah, reviewing a movie, let's say. Do you make notes while you are watching it, or do you wait till the end and just kind of then give it the whole? It's a good feel? question. I, I, I'm very selective about that, which is to say that I'll watch the film with rapt attention, um, and if, if something really stands out that I don't want to forget, oh, that's a good angle for something, I'll kind of write it okay. down. Okay. So I'll end up with a very minimal amount of notes. But, you know, there are some great film critics who, I mean, everything was right after the screening totally in their heads. Yeah. Pauline Kael, who's one of the greatest film critics, and maybe, maybe the greatest of all time, who wrote for The New Yorker for many, many years, during cinema's last heyday in the 70s, uh, would only watch a movie once. And, and she would write these reviews that went on for six, seven, eight pages. Wow. wow. And years later, people would ask her about it. And mm -hmm. even though she had never gone back and seen that film since, she still had a photographic memory for the film and what she had said about it. Wow, but I'm, I'm not quite up to, up to that kind of yeah. snuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of cheat notes to get me there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, yeah, I was just curious what the process was, because it's, uh, yeah. 
And uh, also, that's a tricky British, proposition right. because a lot of critics, if you, you're privileged enough to go to a preview screening, because they get to see it before right. mm -hmm. the mainstream else, audience. Yeah. Yeah. So you go and there's like you know four guys there. It's very very dark, and they all have these <laughs> pens with these little lights. <laughs> in them. Oh, I hate those. <laughs> so so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I tried it once, and I was like, oh man, I had such brilliant insights. This is going to make me like the next Pauline Kale. I could I could publish a collection of. Uh oh. <laughs> And it, it just looked like, it. you know, I'd written one line over the next line, over right. the next line. I mean, it's, oh, this is not going to make any yeah. sense whatsoever. Well, because the light only works if you're away from the paper. As soon as you put it down on the paper, you can't see anything because <laughs> the pen covers up the light. It's, that's actually, it's, it's pointless. How these guys do it every day, I don't know. And it's, yeah. a, thank, it's a thankless job. I was lucky doing it for the net because it's, uh, I could kind of call my own agenda. Yeah. But mm -hmm. people who do it consistently for newspapers and magazines, now that's dying out, but people who do it yeah. consistently for newspapers and magazines, yeah. they have to see everything. They have to see everything. And 75% of it is absolute garbage. And everybody says, oh man, movie critic, what a great job. You know, you sit there yeah, and you watch yeah, movies yeah. all day. Yeah, and you got to sit through, you know, Saw 7. <laughs> and uh, you got to sit through like, uh, ooh, hey, dude, where's my car 8? And you got you know, you to review all this stuff. As yeah. a friend of mine who's a critic says, you know, I do it as a public service. I see these movies so that most people don't have don't to. Don't have to, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, is there, is there good money in it, though? Like, is there, is there no, I got to know. Is there it's, a good question. Question. it's a good question. Um, you know, as a freelancer, not really. You do it, you do it to keep the writing chops up. And you do it for sheer love of cinema. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's okay. why you do it. Yeah. Um, you know. I mean, obviously, if you toil for a newspaper, you know, you get a, you know, get your weekly paycheck doing it. So, you know, as long as that lasts, it's a, it's a, it's a good gig. Yeah. But on the whole, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Is it, is it based on like so many cents per word kind of thing? They... It varies. Some places pay you by the word. Uh, stay away from any place that uh, pays you by the umlaut. The what? I find that that's... The umlaut. Yeah. I'm I'm never, are you guys joking? No, no, no. I had one for breakfast. They're delicious. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kellogg's oh. umlaut. Yeah. But I love the umlaut. So breakfast of yeah. German yeah. champions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. That's what they call uh, delinquents in uh, German. I think in German they call umlauts. But anyway. So you get um, paid via food sometimes? Is this uh, what we're talking about? Uh, I'm trying to think of the weirdest thing I've ever been... Yes. There, there you go. Paid with? That's a very good question. Weirdest thing I've ever been paid with. Uh, I don't clean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want that game. Whatever you're yeah. thinking of. <laughs> That's still up for grabs? <laughs> um, <laughs> this wasn't me, but it happened to a friend of mine. Oh, okay. he, was, he was once paid, right. and remember, it was the 60s. So uh, these guys approached him about writing the script for an experimental film. Of course, you know, it being the 60s, it would be an experimental film. Uh -huh. And at the yeah. end, after all of his revisions, his drafts, the, all the sweat equity this guy puts into it, uh, he was paid with a mantra. <laughs> they said, okay, here's your paycheck, man. We're going to give you a little something that'll, that'll like, last you the rest of your life. You ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go, man. God bless. Good luck. Really? So, yeah, he was paid with a mantra. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's this be the last time you do that. That's how we were going to pay it. Um, <laughs> mantra, that's very funny. Uh, so all this writing stuff, that, that like, where, take us back to the beginning, like, when did you first realize that's, that was going to be your life, for the most part? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. I guess, I guess somewhere around uh, late grade school, I, um, uh, I had fallen in love with comedians on television. And this idea that you know, what I was doing up in my bedroom actually sort of had mass appeal to people. That if you put on a funny costume and yeah, ah, ah, you, know, you walked around yeah. like Jerry Lewis, yeah, uh, yeah. French people would really like it, and so um, <laughs> which they do. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. I thought, oh, that's kind of that's kind of cool. You know, you can actually do this like in your adult years. You don't have to give up this idea of play. That's yeah. kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I decided that okay, well, what is it that really kind of you know makes people laugh once you get kind of beyond the slapstick part of it, the kind of childish, more childish aspect of it. Uh, and so I discovered discovered verbal humor at that at that point, and by the time high school came along. Um, and I was not, I was not a good student, you know, the, 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 the college I went to, you know, uh, once I became somebody, uh, gave me an honorary expulsion, which was really nice. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so school was kind of a hit and miss affair, but when I was missing it, yeah. I was at home watching the afternoon talk shows, which were legion in those years, like, like Merv Griffin and, yeah. and, uh, and Canadian ones like uh, Alan Hamill and that stuff. And they oh always God. brought on stand-up comics. Uh -huh. 
And some guys who went on to become huge names who were nobodies at the time, like mm -hmm. uh, you know Robin Williams and Martin Mull and, and uh, those kinds of people. Yeah. And, uh, and I would listen attentively and I would write their best jokes on like a little shirt cardboard. <laughs> and I would have reams and reams of cardboard with all these one-liners on it. And then whenever there was a thing where you know some of my fellow semi-students, because I wasn't there often, would gather like coffee houses and things at community centers, between the folk acts, mm -hmm. I would come up and I would tell jokes. Mm -hmm. And they went over gangbusters because these guys were in school and didn't hear the jokes. Right. I had a monopoly right. on the material, right. you know? Yeah. I had the best writers in the business. Yeah. Yeah. But you can only do that so often before you, you kind of develop your own material. But it teaches you the, the logic of how a joke is. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. And I would yeah. say for any student of writing, it's a great apprenticeship mm -hmm. because if you, writing is getting, by virtue of the, the evolution of technology, uh, it's getting shorter. You know, you look at the internet and if the passages are very oh, yeah. tiny, yeah. you know, sure. everybody tweets, it's For just sure. so yeah. many characters. Yeah. Everyone's Absolutely. on Facebook, there's only so much space. Absolutely. And, and so when you deliver something to a mass audience these days, in a lot of circumstances, uh, it, it's got the same, you know, structure as a one-liner. So mm -hmm. it's great right. training. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, you know, you, you can go work at a, a fortune cookie factory. You know, it's the same, it's the same yeah. thing for your coverage. Your yeah. coverage. So, um, so it was great trading that way, and then, uh, so really all I had was enough for kind of a stand-up act. So I started doing stand-up in college. Um, that would freak me right out. Like, if there's one thing <laughs> that I would <laughs> never want to do, it would be stand-up. Uh, I'd love to try, but my, my wife says I would not be good at it. So. Well, people but, say they, I think she's just saying that. But people say, rather, people say that rather, people say that they yeah. would rather be thrown into a lion's den than have to do stand-up comedy. It's probably, and that, it's I would the same agree thing, with that. Isn't it? Isn't it? Some nights it is the same. Yeah, thing. you take Some your chances. It's brutal. And yeah. I'm telling a tale out of school here, but uh, it's absolutely true. You know, there is a very, very, very high percentage of stand-up comics every year who commit suicide, and I am uh, not, and I am not kidding. Wow. Well. And it's it's an accumulation of hostile audiences, mm. being on the road all the time. Yep. Very hard to have a family life. Very hard to have kids. The mm -hmm. the paycheck for the most part, unless you hit stardom, is very mediocre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a hard lonely hard lonely. And life. Well, what are some of the drawbacks? Um, <laughs> <laughs> not all the way. I'm like, hey, oh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. It's, oh uh, my goodness. And I get to tell jokes too. Like, hey, that's pretty cool. Where do I sign up? So, what's yeah. your best joke? Or give us one of your good one of your better jokes. One of my better jokes. My gosh, uh, I came up with one yesterday. I really like. Oh, okay. Do, do you guys know what a turducken is? A turducken? A turducken. Now this is something that's yeah. become in foodie circles. It's I yeah, it's oh, a turkey I thought that was inside the of a. You know it. Yeah, it's a uh, chicken inside of a. It's a it's a, a, it's a, a duck. It's a turkey, a duck, and a chicken <laughs> kind of crossbred together to be a meal. So my philosophical comic question is: Is a turducken also known as a menage à foie? <laughs> that's my my most recent. Joke. <laughs> okay. That's funny. That's why I don't do stand up anymore, by the way. That's a year out of that game. Well, yes, I did it for many years. And then oh a guy came gosh. to see me one night, and it wasn't my best night by okay. any means, but he saw something and he said, Hey, you're a pretty funny guy. Mm -hmm. You think you could write radio commercials? And he was part of a, fan, uh, a company that he had started that uh, wrote uh, funny radio commercials that everybody knew. There were okay. less radio stations in town at the time, so yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. everybody knew these and was like, Wow, are you kidding? You want me to write those? Yeah! And so I started off with these guys writing radio ads, and someone came by and wrote a magazine article on this little company in Ottawa that's making successful radio commercials. And there was a guy on an airplane, unbeknownst to us, who was a producer, who was starting up an animated series here in Ottawa called The Raccoons, that eventually yes. would become a big national success in yeah. the 80s. And a whole generation of kids would grow up on it. And he said, eh, gee, I've heard those radio ads, those guys are pretty funny. I'm looking for writers. I wonder if they could write animation. Knocked on our door and that's how I ended up uh, writing animation. Wow. You yeah. never know, right? You never know oh, you when never you know. take yeah. one particular job where that's going to lead to. You really don't, you know, you, you really don't. And, uh, and that was a great education for us because, you know, we'd really never written anything longer than a radio mm -hmm. ad or, or maybe, maybe something for the odd time we tried to go on stage, a little bit of sketch comedy. But now we have to fill, you know, a half hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yikes. And we had to write for kids. Yikes. How do you do yeah. that? Right. So it was a great learning experience. Wow. And, yeah. you know, we were always frustrated that nice as it was and, and uh, welcome as it was by uh, families, that it wasn't more like Bugs Bunny. Because we were, we were essentially stand-ups. You know, mm -hmm. we wanted something more adult, more, more anarchic, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And they would always say, no, 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 take, take that out and put something warm and fuzzy in. What are you guys, idiots? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> So there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that frustrated us. And so when the whole gig ended, 
and I ended up writing or co-writing 28 episodes of that show. Wow. Yeah. I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, that was, that was fun. We move on to the next thing. And, you know, some people liked it, and there we go. Yeah. I never expected it to come back to me boomerang style. And as proof of what you're talking about, you never know what's going to pay off when. No. Years later, I was teaching uh, a script writing class in college. It was my first class. I was the most nervous teacher in the world. Okay, today we're going to learn about the. <laughs> I got to go to the men's room. Nobody leave, you know. And uh, and no matter what I was throwing at these kids, they all sat there like, mm -hmm. yeah. And I was like, okay. And then totally by accident, I said. Anyway, and I used to write for this show, The Raccoon, and the whole place was, no way, you were the guy, no, oh my God, the aardvarks, what the hell was that? Well, well all these questions about this show, you know, wow. oh, you, you remember in episode five with the wah, wah, wah. But suddenly, and I went, oh. suddenly you were that guy. The teacher. Yeah. I hadn't realized that a whole generation had grown up on yeah. that show, and I was like, oh. Yeah. So for a good 10 years, I was, I was the raccoon's guy, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of nice. Yeah. That's very, very cool. And it they actually good. came looking for you, so this was a situation where they knocked on your door because of what you guys were doing before. That's, that's exactly it. And that spawned yeah. other things. Uh, both Ottawa and Montreal had very healthy uh, animation industries yeah. going at the time. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So I ended up doing that. I did, um, uh, uh, for better or for worse, if you remember Lynn uh, Johnson's I remember that. Did I, on I did a couple of voices okay. on I that one, so. too. Yeah, yeah. I thought, There were two yeah. versions of that, an early one, and then they remade it again later. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that, and, and some cartoons that were like just like, like so bad they'll never be rerun. Where yeah. even the animation was like, what happened to that guy's eyes? He's only got one eye. Oh, now he has two. Well, okay. Do you remember any like names of those? Like, uh, yeah. Anything I'd remember? Because I, yeah. I, I watched so much TV like all the time growing up. It was my thing. Oh dear. Well, well, I, I, just in case there's. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah. the, <laughs> right. the one-eyed cartoon guy. Uh -huh. one Everybody wants to guy. sue everybody in this industry. If you know what I'm saying. Well, we want to sue you as well. So <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, we're looking for something. <laughs> <laughs> for something. Yeah, just give us something. And we'll, we'll see it. So um, you can't do that on television. The yes. show, not yes. what yes. we can't do here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge. Ah, yes, and that was around the same time as the raccoons. And uh, was it the same situation? I think it was the same situation. A guy had found out about us and came knocking on our door. It was the, same, it was the same thing. You wrote wow. for You Can't Do That on Television. For many, many years. And everybody, wow. and everybody says, wow, did you meet Alanis? And I have to say, uh, no, see, I was off the show by the time she came. So yeah. I didn't get to meet Alanis. <laughs> uh, but yes, I did write for that. Yeah. Sure. yeah. That's iconic. I, you know what, it's really strange, yep. and, and here it is many, many years later, and uh, people forget that it was all done in, in you know, Ottawa, a little, mm -hmm. little show done here at uh, what was then CJOH Television, mm -hmm. and um, the Nickelodeon network was just starting at that time, and they had zero programming, and I said, well, we can pick up this program pretty cheap from mm -hmm. Canada. Yeah. And they picked up, you can't do that on television, and it was a mega hit in the States. Oh, I yeah. mean, it was incredible. And to this day, and I'm not kidding, all these years later, and I wasn't a public face, I just, I just wrote on this show. Mm -hmm. But it's up on my you know, IMDB site, and all these electronic things you kind of need to kind of billboard yourself these days. Yeah. And uh, I, one day I'm checking my email, and some guy, and I don't know who this guy is, writes in big block <laughs> letters, you used to write for You Can't Do That on television. That show was awesome, dude! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark! And it's like, Bob in San Diego. <laughs> okay. Like, even the writers have fans on this show. Yes. And I have no idea. No idea. That must be nice, though, because uh, I'm, I mean, Allison and I have been writing together for, for nine years now. For a while. And, I th and my own experience is that there's very little recognition in, in terms of the writing. Like, typically, yeah, that's yeah. not an yeah. area where you know, people think of, which is kind of the impetus in doing this show, well, bringing writers to the forefront, because yeah. really, it, nothing starts without the written word. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think even things like documentaries and, uh, and the ubiquitous reality television, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that I just thought. Um, uh, even even that is is scripted. It's not scripted up to here. Yeah. No, but, but it's, all the yeah. dynamics, all the interaction, the, the, the structure of the show, all mm -hmm. all that is pre-planned in a writerly form yeah. long before they roll the yeah. cameras and say to those people, action. Yeah, yeah. Assign them certain. Mm -hmm. You're going to be the bad guy. You're going to you're going to be this and yeah. yeah. Even wrestling. Even yeah. wrestling is written. I, I I know wrestlers, believe it or not, and they've shown me the scripts. See, really? Here's, here's here's how this. Oh, match, I knew I knew it was, it was it was yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. It's written. But yeah. they so they didn't just kind of decide between them. You're gonna you're gonna take the fall on this one. They actually wrote this out. This was well. All... They they kind of write it out, and then as they go along, they kind of see what the audience responds to, and then when they do the huddles and stuff, they kind of ad lib. Okay, let's cut the part about so and so, and go straight to the part off the ropes with this. Okay. 
So even that's real. <laughs> I'm gonna break your arm instead of you breaking my arm. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I wanna be the bad guy. No, I'm the bad guy. No, I'm the bad guy. We talked about this yesterday. When was the last time you skated on the Rideau Canal? Oof. Uh, 1985. Okay. What is your favorite park in Ottawa? Um, hmm, my favorite park in Ottawa would be uh, um, <laughs> Dow's Lake. Have you ever been inside the Parliament buildings? Many times. What is your favorite bar in the Byward Market? Ooh. <laughs> well, uh, I've been sober for 26 years. <laughs> you can say pass. Pass. Then. So, uh, okay. Okay. Where do you go to be recognized the most in Ottawa? <laughs> wow. Um, any male strip club. Okay. <laughs> What is the last Ottawa restaurant you dined and dashed at? <laughs> I don't like the way this is uh, oh, no, assassinating no, my character. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. It's getting The better. last one I dined and dashed at. I, I don't know, like maybe when I was a teenager, like McDonald's. I was a kid, well, can you dine and dash you know, at McDonald's? You said, That's pretty hard. You could have said I never did. Oh, um, Name the establishment. Oh, do you want to no. right, you go read name the, the Name the establishment that you were last kicked out of. Holy cow. It's got to be in Ottawa, though. Name the establishment that I was last kicked out of. Uh, I don't think it exists anymore, but there used to be, uh, well, actually it was probably the last bar I was in on Elgin Street. I think it was called the Penguin at the time. Oh, okay. Speaking of streets, what would be your favorite street to, to streak on? Ah, uh, some street where there's a lot of families. Okay, so, so like Alta Vista is good. Alta Vista, perfect. On a perfect. Saturday afternoon, can't be. <laughs> yeah. oh, where in Ottawa were you last arrested? Was I last arrested? Oh gosh, so many memories. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, dressed as a man or a woman? Oh, you know what? Doesn't, it doesn't say. matter. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, uh, where I was last arrested? Uh, I would have to say at um, uh, by the Byward Market. It was at the same bar that you were <laughs> kicked out of the no longer no existing. That was Elgin Street. And it caught fire. And funny, <laughs> funny enough. Now, okay, last question, very easy. Which area of town did you last go through a ride program successfully? Uh, I like Vanier because you get to uh, drive the cops home. <laughs> so that's the cops. That's yeah. that well, that was a bit of silliness, and that was uh, a bit. Uh, just a bit, yeah. Are the two of you have worked together? We have. Yes, we have. Yes. Have you been in a position to uh, hire Norm or fire him, or is it more just sort of his colleagues? I have never had that honor. I will never have that honor. No. You know what? And I will say this, and I am not saying this facetiously. Norm uh, has always been considered, and not just by me, but the uh, Robin Williams of Ottawa, a guy who had this very, very no. prolific, <laughs> mindful of comic fireworks that went off and could kind of riff on any subject, and people admired him tremendously for that. So I, I've always thought of you. Mm -hmm. As uh, Ottawa's uh, Robin Williams. Uh, no, it's true. And any time he's been in something I've written, he's always done a slam bang, yeah. slam bang job. No, I which know. Which is why he's always well, had very small yeah. supporting parts. But you know, he's always yeah. done a great job. Yeah, we give him 20 seconds maximum because after he, that. He's never even made the actor a minimum yet. But you know, a couple of more credits and you'll get your card. Here you you'll go. get your card. The card. Let's talk about your movies because you, you yeah. write incredible movies and, um, and, and you, you bring huge stars to film those, Yes, right? I, I was very, very lucky in that uh, I was in a circumstance where I was hooked up with a local production company, very ambitious local production company, called uh, Distinct Features, yeah. currently up in Northern Ontario filming all kinds of TV series. But at that time, their main focus was uh, independent feature film. Okay. You might remember late 90s, early part of the millennium, uh, there was an absolute boom in independent feature film. Things had come out like a Blair Witch Project, mm -hmm. and people oh, yeah, went, yeah, yeah. wow, anybody can make a movie now. Yeah. And the technology was such that, hey, you didn't have to go to Hollywood or even Toronto. You could make it in your own backyard. Now you can do it on a phone. I mean, that's how I much know. it's been. I know. You know, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. kind of made smaller. And, uh, and so uh, high tech was booming in Ottawa at the time. So we went to uh, board high tech millionaires. And believe it or not, there used to be quite a few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we pitched these guys on, uh, on making movies. And we kind of had the chops, you know, they're very good crews in Ottawa. Not a lot of them, there were just a few, but they were very good. Uh, I'd been writing for a long time, you know, we'd done the raccoons, you can't do that on television. By that point, we had also done some uh, uh, TV documentaries and we had done some uh, TV series. So the, the chops were there. Uh, and someone said, hey, you know, it's like I cost a lot of money. It, it's just a tax write-off for me. So I'm sure, here's a couple of bucks, go make a movie. <laughs> and so off we went to make some movies and we ended up making five. And the first one, which is still my favorite, which was uh, a spoof of um, gangster films called uh, Two's a Mob. Two's a Mob, yeah. Written yeah. by myself and a very talented guy I've worked with on and off for years, Rick Colbars, okay. who later wrote uh, all the Kevin Spencer um, 
animated TV series that was a big right. hit on TV for many years. Is he from Ottawa as well? He is. He is yeah. You should have him on the show. Wow. You should have him on the show. He's a he's a very charming, big, slovenly man. He's uh, <laughs> he a little long day. Anyway. <laughs> So, um, uh, was I insulted just that I, because I, I, I can't tell them. I'm getting you back for the blitz, my man, for yeah. the blitz. Mm. Anyway, so, uh, he and I, we had offices above a video store back when those existed mm -hmm. at yeah. the time. And we said, gee, parodies are big, but no one's done gangster movies. Why don't we do that? Oh, that's a good idea. So we went down to the Blockbuster and uh, we took out all these DVDs. Or actually, I think they were cassettes at the time. VHS. VHS, right? yeah. yeah. And we watched all these things all day long and we made wisecracks about the movies, as funny people, as you know, tend to do. Mm -hmm. And every time we had one that was pretty good, I wrote it down, I wrote it down, I wrote it down. Just like I used to put the one liners on yeah. the right, shirt okay. cardboard. Yeah. And in three days, we had enough jokes to make like 10 movies, because all this movie was going to be really was like joke, 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 joke. It was just a parody of other scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put together the script in three days, a little bit of continuity, and boom. Wow. And everybody said, great, let's shoot it. And we went off in the uh, summer of 1998. We went out and, uh, and we shot that movie. Wow. And uh, yeah. it still plays on television every now and again, yeah. and got nice reviews. And it's, it's got very funny scenes in it that I like a lot. Unfortunately, it wasn't as big a success on the festival circuit, which is kind of the main way indies are marketed. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. For a couple yeah. of reasons. Uh, number one, people said, this is really funny, but there are no stars in it. So we don't really know who you guys are. We have a hard time selling, not the premise, but the personalities. So we mm -hmm. thought, okay, we better get stars if we do this again. And uh, number two, you know, Comedies on indie festivals, it's, it's, that doesn't happen very often. That's it where they break happen. in, okay. you know, nice independent dramas. Yes. Comedies, yeah. not so much. Uh, so we said, okay, so we're going to try to segue from comedy to drama, and we're going to make sure that we have stars. That's a huge segue. It right? was, it was. And yeah. I had never really written drama before. I'd mm -hmm. watched a million things and read a million things, but I'd never done it. So it was my first chance to kind of write drama and I'm like, do I gotta uh, uh, be able to do this? Uh. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to let go of the comic umbilical cord entirely. So the first thing I did was a comedy drama. I had some laughs, right. had some serious moments. Wasn't sure if that was gonna work because when you mix and match like that, um, it's very difficult. If you don't do it right, it kind of looks like two tectonic plates rubbing together. It's not smooth, it's not mm -hmm. uniform, it's very tough. And also it's tough to market. You know, oh, because people so. always say drama, comedy, chick flick, action flick. But now they now they have a category, dramedy, right? Which is like a yeah. dramatic comedy kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, and that's kind of evolved you yeah. know, over time. But at that time it was like, well, do we say this is a comedy? Do we say this is a drama? drama? Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 I don't know. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of tough that way. So they had to sell it on stars. And we didn't have a lot of dough. So I said, okay, guys, I'm sure there are stars out there who aren't the biggest stars in the world. But, you know, we can find them. Having had that vintage film mind, I thought, oh, well, I'm sure there's lots of big stars out there who haven't worked in a while, who used to be big, who will work for relatively cheap. So I started thinking about the casting, and, you know, as we ended up making four independent features, but there was um, Ernest Borgnine. I know, that's, I was going to say, yeah. Academy Award winner from 1955. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the guy was, you know, I, I, I actually, I think it was like in Renfrew or something, a little town outside Ottawa. I went in one day to like a truck stop. And there was a video of Ernest Borgnine made by his son. And there was just a whole movie of Ernest Borgnine driving in an SUV across America. Oh, yeah, right, right, yeah. Like, okay, if this guy's doing this, yeah. pretty sure we can get him. Pretty how, sure. How do you do that? Like, how, who calls these, these you know, stars up? And, and well, what, you, like, how, what kind of a phone conversation would yeah. that be? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. we're shooting a film. And, yeah. Yeah. and this is pre-internet, so trying to find right. who represents whom was not easy. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, I'll just, I'll just start calling people and see what happens. And you know, I called the big agencies, William Morris right. and you know, CAA and all those guys. And they, uh, they would all say, no, we don't have him. He's with so-and-so. Oh, thank you. Do you have a number? And you know, phone and call, phone call, phone call. They Sorry. actually gave you that information at that time. They do that, but they, they, they say, what is this for? They say, is this for a professional circumstance? Uh -huh. And all you have to say is yes. And they say, okay. So they screen you, but right. like... Like, like that much, yeah. those guys yeah, yeah. aren't in charge of like international security you know ice will be everywhere right? <laughs> oh yeah come on in you're good yeah, you're yeah. good you're, 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 um, you're not a terrorist no okay come on you know be like that. so anyway so um so yeah so i call these guys up and then you'd start going back and forth with the agents you know you try to kind of lowball them and they, they're like oh no 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 they try to go up and a bit of a, bit of a game yeah and you try not to say look i know this guy hasn't worked since you know right. the stone age you know, you know, play that part. Uh -huh. uh, but you could get them for, relatively speaking, uh, cheap. 
then I thought, okay, other, other avenues. And uh, I recall, you know, Michael Moriarty had just been kicked off of a hit show Law and Order at the time. Well, that's right. Because he was a bit of a bad boy and a bit of a mental case. That was the, the, the thinking. Yeah. So I yeah. thought, this guy's probably at home twiddling his thumbs. <laughs> yeah. He's been blacklisted. Let's yeah. call him. And I knew that he had a Canadian connection. He, I'd read somewhere in a trade magazine he was seeing a woman in Halifax or something. So I thought, okay, he obviously spends some time in Canada. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. got a hold of his agent. It was some young hotshot. And the guy gives me a real hard time. Pfft, you know, I mean, not everybody gets Michael Moriarty. I'm sorry. I mean, if you want to talk, act it like, yes, I represent God. What do you want? You know? I'm like, okay, well, guys, I don't think we're getting Michael Moriarty. But he said, but, but you know, send me, send me the script anyway. And I'll, uh, yeah. And don't forget, I hadn't written drama very much at this point. But I'd written him a long, dramatic passage, kind of his climax in the film, a film called House of Luck, which you were in, yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I sent him just that, just that page. And I'm like, Arr. And one day, one day I walk into the boss's office, and he turns on the answering machine, because, you know, old technology back then. Mm. <laughs> and it's the agent, and he's this, I don't know, guys. And he's like, hey, hey, guys, Michael would love to do it. Hey, I just love you. Hey, you want to come to my place? I'll make dinner. You, you want to sleep with my wife? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm like, uh, oh, I guess my writing's okay. <laughs> and what happened is Moriarty fell in love with this passage that I wrote. He thought oh, it was yeah. a beautiful passage, and mm -hmm. he said, whatever these guys want, you know, I'll, I'll do it. Wow. So we one got page? this guy for peanuts. Yeah, one page. Wow. One page. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was a speech. He had a beautiful speech. I'd like to read that. And one of the highest compliments I ever got on my writing was this guy shows up on the set. And first of all, this guy's tall. On TV, he doesn't look at it, but this guy's like enormous. Uh -huh. And he's got a head like, you know, it's like, yeah. a, like the world's biggest bobblehead. <laughs> But his head is this big because his brain is this big. I'm not kidding. This guy's absolutely freaking brilliant. Any topic you can think of, like, like politics, history, uh, I mean, boom, 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 boom. I mean, wow. Mm. He must have an IQ that's like gargantuan. And, and a great actor besides. And the first thing he does when he gets on the set, he says, okay, uh, where's, where, where's the writer? Find the writer. I'm like, uh-oh. He wants me to rewrite something. There's something he's not happy with. Something. Yeah. So very nervously, I think I was wearing a baseball cap at the time, I say, uh, uh, hi, hi, Mr. Boriardi. I'm the guy who wrote this. <laughs> You're the guy who wrote this? Uh-huh. And he takes my baseball cap and he lifts it up so he can take a good look at my face. And he says, forget about writing comedy, kid. Keep writing drama. And I was like, ooh. Wow. Guy like mm. that, man. Wow, that you know, nice. when Tennessee Williams wrote his autobiography in the 70s, uh, he said, people always ask me who Marlon Brando is, the next Marlon Brando is. And he said, mark my words, Michael Moriarty will be the next greatest actor America has ever seen. Mm -hmm. So to have a guy of that caliber say to me, like, this is good stuff. That's something else. I was like, okay, now I know I can write drama because yeah. I got the ultimate rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. I, there was one question that I wanted desperately to ask you, and um, I think this would probably be our last question, so we can we want to give you the spotlight. But as as a writer, um, you've been I have to assume you've been on set while the action's been happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and this may go back to those those early childhood days, the the, the feeling of euphoria in play. But how did it feel to you when you had someone like? Moriarty or Ernest Bornine or you know, Terry Garr or Graham Greene or uh, Eli know, Wallach. Eli Wallach, Wallach yeah. yeah. Wow. How Eli did, Wallach. Yeah, exactly. He was, he was great. How did it feel to be sitting there and looking at them speaking your words that you wrote, that you well, came up with? Well, I, I, you know, some of those people were very nice. Some of those people are very difficult to, to work with. I won't tell you kind of who, who was who. So you yeah. have different experiences with different people. And mm. some people get the writing, like Moriarty, and other people kind of don't get it, and the director tries to explain it to them, and they don't get it. Then they bring the writer in, and he tries to explain it, and they still don't. So it's not always such a like, wow, a star read my script kind of moment. But I can tell you with, uh, with Moriarty, because he's such a great actor, when he read that passage in that uh, scene that I wrote for him, and I was yeah. on the set at the time, about halfway through, I remembered thinking to myself, I don't know who wrote this man, but it's not me, because it's too good. Wow. <laughs> so he took I can't that. write like that. Like he just made that, he just made that sing. Some veteran screenwriter, some novelist, some known commodity wrote this. Yeah. Not some guy who wrote it in an office on Bank Street in Ottawa. <laughs> it was that good. And to show you technically how good this guy was, halfway through the passage, he uh, he leaves a nice little dramatic pause, which you know I did write into the passage. And he takes a little sip from a cup of tea, puts the cup of tea down, and finishes the passage. Director yells, cut, and says, hey, nice bit with the cup of tea. 
And Maury says, Moriarty says, what are you, stupid? What do you mean, nice bit? And he said, you know, we had the cup of tea at that nice little moment. He said, what, you didn't hear it? Hear what? There was a truck coming down the street, and I knew it was going to blow the tape, so I had the tea to my lips until the truck passed, and after the truck went, I put the cup down. <laughs> oh, 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 my Nice gosh. bit. Yeah. Nice yeah. bit. Like, that's how technically proficient this guy was. Wow. So to have that guy read your script and make the words something. come alive. Wow. Wow, that is something. That is crazy. Are you that technically proficient? No. No, I didn't think so. Uh, <laughs> but you look good. Well, yeah, thank, thank you. Say, thank well, thanks much. for reading my lines. Now, why don't you take the lozenge out of your mouth and say it again? <laughs> You have a choice. Uh, you could tell us your most embarrassing story, okay. or just do what's written down in the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's simple. Oh, it's God. simple. Oh, oh, oh. No, it's really an easy oh, choice. Man. Yeah. Which way do you think he's going to go? I don't know. I'm, I don't I'm, know I'm trying well to as you know. He likes to take risks, he but at the same yeah. time, he's got a lot of stories, too. He does so, have a lot of stories. Yeah. He might go for the story. Well, he might go for the story. Okay, I'm going for the story. You're going for the story. Okay. okay. But I'm only going, going for the story because it would give you guys some uh, some celebrity cash in. Uh, okay. Right. So I'm helping you out here. That we have right. I'm have helping you out here. Um, and this was before I was writing movies, and I hadn't met a lot of stars. And one day, I'm walking downtown in Ottawa, and I really have to go to the bathroom. And there's the National Arts Center. So I'm like, I'll just quickly go to the bathroom at the Arts Center. Mm -hmm. So I go, and I haven't shaved, and I'm just dressed like my everyday clothes. Yeah. And I go to the uh, Arts Center, and unbeknownst to me, there's this huge, important black tie gala going on. And it's gowns and tuxedos and me kind of looking, you know, like I'm homeless. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe if I stay at the back here, no one will notice me. So I squirrel off, and I go to the men's room, and I'm at the urinal. And I look beside me, and there's a guy in a tuxedo, and it's Leslie Nielsen who had just come off of Police Squad, the TV series. It was right. a short-lived TV series yes. before it became a series of movies. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I know you. You're Leslie Nielsen. And he's like, what? Well, yes, I am. Nicest guy in the world. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm so sorry. Police Squad got, got canceled, and, and, and it was such a great show, and I loved it. And it was a lot like Two's a Mob. Joke, yeah. joke, 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 joke. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, we're thinking of uh, you know, making some movies based on that, on that uh, movie, uh, TV show, which eventually became Naked Gun. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, really? That's great. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, gosh, I'm, this is fantastic. Okay, well, thank you. Oh, thank you. So I shake his hand, and I'm so like, wow. And as I'm shaking his hand, I realize I've forgotten to do up my fly, and I'm still going. <laughs> and just like a bad joke in the Naked Gun movies, uh, all over Leslie Nielsen's shiny black tuxedo shoes. So uh, I truly left my imprint. <laughs> On, uh, okay, that, that was worthy. Celebrity. That was worthy of the challenge. <laughs> but now I want to know That's what's good. in the envelope. What was in the envelope? Oh well, if I told you, oh, I don't know. Should I? Should we do it? Should we tell him? Tell him what he was show. playing yeah. for. This is like this is like uh, knowing what was behind the door. Oh, this is simple. It was basically starting with the current prime minister named the last five Canadian prime ministers. I think he probably could have done it. Uh, I think I could have. Let's see. Starting with the current. Starting with yeah. the current. Starting with the current. Right, with the yeah, current. Yeah, Trudeau. You had Harper. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, Chrétien, uh -huh. you had, uh, it was a tough one now, I think, uh -huh. I think Kim Campbell, mm -hmm. and then Mulroney. Ah, you missed one. Who did I, John Turner? Who did I miss? Paul Martin. Oh, and that's, Paul that's, Martin. Yeah, that's actually, that stumped both of us. Yeah. Paul Martin. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Justin Trudeau, Stephen Harper, Paul right, Martin, right. then Jean Chrétien. Then people Kim think Campbell. that, uh, you know, these are uh, kind of well-guarded people. But unlike the United States, if you're an ex-prime minister in Canada, you can yeah. still walk the streets. Mm -hmm. And one day I'm walking down Spark Street, and there's uh, Joe Clark and Paul Martin walking up the street together. And this woman stops next to me and she goes, oh my God, look, it's, it's, it's Paul Martin and it's uh, Joe Clark, two ex-prime ministers. And I say to her, wow, two and a half years of experience between the two of them. Kind of took the bloom off the rose there. Uh, right? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah, he destroyed it for somebody, but in a good way. <laughs> hey, man, it's Canada. you got to keep people humble, because that's who we are. Humble. Right? So, humble yeah. Canadian. Yes. What have you prepared for your, your moment? Well, um, and not, not to do it right now. We're going to give you a couple of minutes to, okay. to prepare. Okay, but. prepare for my moment. I already told you guys my story about uh, Mr. Moriarty. Yes. So, uh, but I got another a wonderful compliment that uh, I always remember. And it's kind of a guiding light. It's sort of a, a verbal talisman or a mental talisman. When you have a bad writing day and you go, ah, oh, God, this just isn't what? Who am I fooling? This is so stupid. No, 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 don't, you know. Yeah, one of those days. And I always remember what this person said to me. Okay. And I go, if that person said this, I'm doing something right. 
Okay. Well, so I will quote that for you. Okay, perfect. So we are looking forward to seeing this. Very much. It's, we'll been a, it's been a pleasure having you. It's been awesome. It's so uh, yeah. we're going to give you a couple of minutes to right. yeah. prepare. All right. And then we'll see you. Awesome. Good luck with the show. I look forward to the next two episodes before it's canceled. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Poor Norm. Someone get him a job. <laughs> One of the greatest compliments ever afforded to me as a writer came from that great actor, Eli Wallach, with whom I had the privilege to work with uh, sometime in the early millennium. And he was quite, uh, quite a veteran at that point, eventually passed on some years later at the age of 98 or 99, I believe. But he was still, you know, very sharp up here. And we met him at a hotel at the Chateau Laurier because uh, he wanted to go over the script. So very nervously I sat while he poured over the script. And finally, in that great gravelly voice of his, after he took a pause and looked a little perplexed, and I was like, uh-oh, what's he going to say? He turned to me and he said, eh, you know who your writing reminds me of? And I'm like, uh, no. And he looked at me in the eye, he goes, Anton Chekhov. And I was like, wow. So in this, uh, from that day forward, whenever I have a bad day, whenever I sit there, the words don't, Sound musical, the structure is wonky. I want to go and run a chip wagon or do anything else with my life other than this. I always have that little gravelly voice in my head saying, Anton Jacob. Thank you. <laughs>